Shall we rise up as we pray? Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study once again tonight. We thank you because you delight in teaching us and revealing your mind to us. What a Father you are, that you tell us the things that will happen in the future that will affect each of us. We pray, Lord, as you tell us, we'll be well prepared for that future day, that final day. In Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will take your word and inscribe and write all these words indelibly in our hearts in Jesus' name. We pray that the grace will be obedient to your word, looking unto Jesus alone, without looking here and there, without being distracted from preparing for eternity. The grace to do that, you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that everybody here, and all that hear the sound of my voice, may be through kisses, will think about their eternity. Will push every other thing aside for the moment, so that your spirit will have a chance to tell him or her whether it's ready for eternity or not. Lord, we pray that you perfect us. You purify us. You purge us. And do everything there is to be done so as to get us ready for that final judgment day. Help us, Lord, not to be like children who will take precious things and handle them as if they were toys. Help us to know the importance of coming before you, listening to you and hearing your word, so that, Lord, your purpose and plan for such a study, regularly every week like this, will be fulfilled in our lives. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to the Bible study tonight, we come once again to you our systematic study of the Word of God. When I say systematic study of the Word of God, we study from chapter to chapter and from verse to verse. Right now we are in Second Peter. And we are in chapter 2 of Second Peter. We've already covered verses 1 through to 6. And now we're looking at verses 7 all through to 12. Open your Bible with me as I read. And deliver just Lord. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day for their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Verse 10, but chiefly, them that walk after the flesh, in the lust of uncleanness, and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring no railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken, and destroyed. They speak evil of the things they understand not, and they shall utterly perish in their corruption. And those are the verses we're looking at today. As we study the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, and you study this particular section and portion of scripture, there's something you are going to discover that our character, our lifestyle here on earth have eternal consequences. Our character is a product of who we believe and what we believe. Our character is a result, a product of what we don't believe and who we don't believe. Faith and unbelief produce fruits, although different fruits. On the one hand, genuine faith in Christ and in his word will make us to be born again. That genuine faith, saving faith, will make us to have eternal life. And that kind of faith produces a life of obedience to the word of God. As you look at unbelief on the other hand, here is what you will discover, that unbelief on the other hand will make people to disregard God and disregard the word of God. And to lead to please sell and to displease the almighty God. It's unbelief that leaves a man to be to himself. 
And then it's under the irresistible power and influence and yoke of Satan. In his unbelief, man is without God, without Christ, without God's restraining grace. Consequently, is without the true righteousness. That's why unbelief, ex unbelief exposes a person to the judgment of God. He doesn't have God. The word of God is not in control of his life. And he moves on in this world only propelled and compelled by the pride of his own heart or the influence and power of Satan the devil that wants to destroy his soul without God, without grace, without mercy on the final judgment day. By the way, you may be asking the question, what is it that produces faith in our hearts? And what it is, is it that produces unbelief in people's hearts? The faith which in turn produces eternal life and makes us to live a Christ-like life. What produces that kind of faith? The Bible tells us it's hearing and believing the word of God preached by righteous ministers of God, appointed by God, taught by the Spirit of God, anointed by the Spirit of God, and sent by the Spirit of God. What is it that produces unbelief and encourages unbelief? What is it that makes a man to live as if there is no law? There is no way of righteousness. What is it that makes a man, a woman, a boy, a girl to live as if anything you do is all right? And then they go through life waiting for an eternity that will bring punishment upon them. It's unbelief. And it's that kind of unbelief that produces an ungodly lifestyle. And it leads to eternal damnation. What produces that kind of unbelief? It's hearing the words of false prophets. Accepting the words of false prophets. Believing the words of false prophets and relying on the words of false prophets so that their lives are filled with false hope because the false prophets give them false hope. The false teachers preaching false doctrines will give them false hope. The false prophets might tell them, it doesn't matter what you do, raise up your hand, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can go through life and live whichever way you want and you'll be all right for all eternity. And that false prophet preaching eternal security to the people that remain in their sins will give them false hope that they will not be able to make it in the final day. Other people say, in really holiness, nobody can live a holy life. And if we're going to wait for us to live a holy life before we get to heaven, nobody else will make it. Therefore, you might as well go on, live the way you want, try as much as you can. After all, nobody can live a holy life. Let it go and just live the way you want. And those false prophets give us false hope. Us prophets, they give us false hope. They think, they tell us that if we have faith and we are healed. They tell us if we have faith and we are, we are delivered. And we have faith, we have all these other blessings of life without having the faith to overcome sin, to conquer sin, to live a righteous and a holy life. They say, after all, if we have faith in God and we are able to get this and that, isn't that showing that we are somebody in the kingdom of God? And they give us the false hope. And because we don't read our Bibles that Jesus Christ himself said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. Because many shall come to me on that day, and they shall say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that walk in equity. These people that tell us that faith for miracles, Faith for healing, faith for deliverance, and faith for all the provisions and prosperity of life is all we need. They deceive us. They do not tell us that the real faith that gets us to heaven and makes us to spend eternity with Almighty God is the faith that crushes your sin, cancels your sin, and makes you to live a righteous and a holy life. That's why the apostle was telling the people, the Corinthians in particular, he said, are you listening to another gospel, a deceptive gospel? An erroneous gospel. Another gospel that gives you false hope. And when you remain in that false hope, you are going to spend eternity in hell for a turn with me in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 it says, But I fear 
lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In verse 4, for Eve, he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if ye have received another spirit, whom ye have not received. Or another gospel, which ye have not accepted. Ye might as well bear with him. It says there are people, number one, they preach another Jesus. Number two, they, they proclaim another spirit. Number three, and they preach another gospel. Another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. And this is the Jesus that excuses their sin glosses over their sin and they forget the ministry and the mission of jesus his name shall be called jesus for he shall save his people from their sins that the reason why jesus came he came not to condemn but to save the world the world from sin and when you become born again whosoever is born of god does not commit sin for the seed of god remains him abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god but these people, they preach another Jesus, the sweet Jesus, the loving Jesus, and the Jesus that overlooks your sin and doesn't care what you do. And they preach another spirit. Because when Jesus was talking about the Holy Ghost, he said, the spirit whom the world cannot receive, the spirit that these other people are proclaiming and the anointing, they're trying to put upon the people, the world can receive that anointing. The worldly people can receive that spirit. And the people that have not repented from their sins, they can receive that spirit. And the people can speak in tongues. And they can say they have the gifts of the spirit. And they're still fighting with their wives at home. And they're still getting angry. And they will not make restitution. And they will not live in righteousness. And yet they have the spirit. Another spirit. That's why the apostle was telling them, What kind of spirit have you people received? Speaking in tongues, manifesting prophecy and interpretation of tongues, and there's fighting and rebellion and unrighteousness and sin and stealing and fraud among you. Are you receiving another spirit? Is this another gospel? As you look at the gospel that people say they are preaching today, the, preach, uh, the gospel that doesn't have power to break the yoke of sin. All the yoke, the gospel they are preaching is trying to break is the generational cause and the yoke of forefathers and the yoke of this and the yoke of that. But the real yoke that needs to be broken, the yoke of the devil, bondage to the devil and bondage to sin. They do not preach the gospel that breaks that yoke. That's why the apostle was saying, this kind of spirit you are receiving, and this kind of gospel you are hearing that doesn't have the power to save you from sin. This is another God. It says, yes, I know. Now I understand the reason why in verse 13. For such are false apostles. Deceitful workers. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers are will be also transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Listen to this. Whose end shall be according to what? Uh, uh, when a person makes somebody who had been steadfast in Christ, when he makes that person shaky, unstable, when he makes somebody who had been following Christ steadily, regularly, steadfastly, he makes that person to turn away from Christ, when a preacher, when an apostle, so-called apostle, and so-called prophet, and so-called evangelist, and so-called preacher, when he turns somebody away from the path of righteousness, the people that have been pursuing after God, and pursuing after righteousness, I want to be holy, I want to be righteous, make me holy, purify me, maybe by fire or by flood, whichever way, just purify me. All I want in my life, my soul is thirsting after God, I want to be righteous, I want to be holy. Then the false preacher and the false teacher takes that person, when he takes that person, that person, the fire is down. Lukewarmness comes. And it's not utter holiness or righteousness anymore. And that false preacher turns his mind away from righteousness unto righteousness, unto sin, unto pride, unto self. And self-management. When a preacher does that, of course, that's a false prophet. And he says, whose end shall be? according to their works. And so you'll find that as we look at the scriptures, the warning is very clear. What we hear, 
what we meditate on, has a strong influence on us. It affects our lives and determines our eternal destiny. The question then is, where will you spend eternity? Because where you spend eternity will depend largely upon what you are hearing and who you are listening to. True prophets will help you to have your focus on Christ and to pray to the Lord and to receive grace from the Lord so that you have Christ's righteousness. And true prophets are the people that help you to focus on eternity. Focus on eternity and focus on heaven. And eventually they leave you. They don't leave you alone. They keep on talking. They keep on warning. They keep on preaching. They keep on pleading. They keep on praying. They keep on doing everything there is to do until they see you through. That you enter the gate. Then they leave you. They say bye bye now. I've done my job. You can now spend eternity with Christ. But false prophets, on the other hand, they lead you away from Christ. They lead you away to live without the true righteousness and to spend eternity without Christ. To spend eternity apart from Christ. That's why the study we're having is so serious. And Whenever we come to a study like this, any study actually of the Bible, we don't come with a light mind, with levity, with, with frivolity. Whenever we come to study the word of God, we come with a serious mind. Because the eternal God is conveying to us the unchanging, changeless gospel. Because of wanting to prepare for an eternity that wants to die, your eternity is determined. And you'll not be able to change it again. That's why the reason, that's the reason why whenever we come, we're as serious as we can be. Because we're carrying the precious message of the eternal God. To never dying souls. What you do with it will be your responsibility. I break the study today to three points. Number one, conditional preservation of the righteous. The conditional preservation of the righteous. Number two, confirmed punishment for the unrighteous. The punishment of the unrighteous is confirmed. In the whole Bible, go through your Bible, Genesis, Revelation, the punishment of the unrighteous is confirmed. Number three, the character and the practice of the unrighteous. We come to number one, conditional preservation of the righteous. It's in Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 7 to the first part of verse 9. And he delivered just Lot. That means he delivered Lot that was counted just. What do you describe? What do you say about that, about that Lot? Because he was vexed. He was troubled. He was in agony. Because of the filthy conversation of the wicked. And look up here. What he's saying is, it's unfortunate that this Lot actually made a wrong choice. But we need to understand that he had limited opportunity and limited privilege and limited light. Why I say that is, the Bible had not been written at that time. Not even a verse of the Bible had been written. All he had was an oral message spoken from the mouth of Abraham and given unto him. There was no written scripture at that time. All he had was... My nephew, Lord, God said this. God said this. And when you believe God, it's counted unto you as righteousness. And you ought to live like this, and live like this, and live like this. I, because I just heard the word of the Lord. And the Lord said, this is the way anybody having a relationship with me ought to walk. That's all Lord had. It's unfortunate because, you know, he had not had the whole revelation of the scripture. Not like us. You have 66 books of the Bible. Genesis, Revelation. You have opportunity come in every Monday. You have all the cases. You have all the books. You have all the trials. And you have the retreats and the conferences and the congresses. And you have quite a lot of righteous influence upon your life. His own case was not like that. But the literally knew and the literally had when he made the choice and went to Sodom. It was strange. And everything the people did, their immorality, their fornication, their sodomy, their fraud, their fighting, their violence. It was like a dagger in his heart. Every time he saw something that he, he said, this is not right. It vexed his righteous soul before the Lord. Let's bring it to, home to ourselves. With his limited light and limited knowledge, 
When he saw the people on the street, and he saw the people in Sodom, and he saw the people in Gomorrah, and they were doing those sinful, unrighteous things, it troubled him. It pained him. It brought tears in his eyes. It vexed his soul. How about you? When you're on the street, and you see how the people dress, and you see how the people behave, and you see how the people fight, and you see how the people make trouble, and you see how the people are sinful and unrighteous, and you see how the drunkards take the watch of God, and they jest and joke and ridicule the Almighty God when they are drunk, and you see all the songs they are singing, and they turn this holy scripture, holy Bible, and they turn it into a scene of jest. Are you pricked in your heart? Are you troubled in your heart? Are you vexed in your soul? Are you so much in agony that you say, what kind of world is this? When you see a 12-year-old girl, when you see a 15-year-old girl, when you see a child, a teenager getting pregnant, are you bothered? Does it touch your heart? Does it touch your soul? When you see people killing one another, and you are going by the way, and you see innocent people that lie on the ground, because, you know, somebody got angry and threw something at them and killed them, does it touch you? Or are you so desensitized? Because of the evil in society, you've seen it so often, it doesn't bother you anymore. When you hear of a backslider, a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, that was in Christ, and marching with us on the way to heaven, and now he's gone back into the world, you hear about it, and you see it, and you see the degradation, and the pit into which they are falling, and you see the doom that is going to come upon them. Are you touched? Are you bothered? Does it touch your heart? Are you in agony? Or do you just go your way and do your normal thing and say your normal thing because, you know, everybody is doing that and it's happening everywhere. Does it touch you? When you hear a believer, one of us here, that you trust and you rely upon and you can almost lean your whole life upon that person and that person deceives and lies and it's hypocritical and it, all that he does is in pretense and you discover it later do you just smile it off and say well that's how you know present day believers that's how they are do you just smile it off does it touch your heart are you in agony in the case of lord with the limited understanding that he had it says it vexed his soul he delivered that's why he delivered him he delivered just lord vexed troubled in agony because of the filthy conversation of the wicked because it says in verse 8 for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with the unlawful with the unlawful deeds he never got readjusted and you know the first time you see evil it touches you you almost cry you tremble so the world is like this you see the second time for most people, it doesn't touch you anymore like that. The early years of this ministry and church, when we exalted holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. When we hear that somebody backslides because of a foolish, irrelevant, useless, worthless thing, interaction or intercourse with a lady. And eventually when you see the lady, the lady is as ugly as ugliness could be. And you say, what? See this man having eternal life. See this man that had Jesus Christ with him. See this man with his name in the book of life. See this man enjoying the privileges of the Christian life. Getting hooked and getting at that to this ugliness of all, of all people. That as you look at the lady, you'll see that the lady is not just ugly, she is ugliness personified. And this man lost eternal life, lost heaven, lost relationship with God, lost his good position in the church because of attraction to this ugly thing. It touches your heart. You cry in those years. But today, when you, see, when you hear that somebody has done something like that, it's lost eternal life, it's lost relationship with God, it's lost his place and position amid the people of God, does it touch your heart again? In the case of Lord, every day, it says day by day, from day to day, the unrighteous did touch his heart. When he saw them and when he heard them, that's the reason why God preserved him. And the first part of verse 9, it says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly, the righteous, the just, out of temptation, out of tribulation, out of the perdition. Now, you need to understand that although judgment is certain and inescapable for the unrighteous, the righteous will be preserved from divine wrath. 
and eternal judgment. Examples and illustrations are bound in the scriptures to prove that the just, the righteous God will not destroy the righteous or the wicked. Neither will the rod of the wicked rest upon the lot of the righteous on the final day of judgment. God will spare his children, his saints who have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. But he will not excuse, he will not spare the unrighteous. That's the reason the apostle is telling us if we're going to escape the judgment of God, we need to have this righteous heart and righteous disposition and righteous life. That when we see sin, like Lord saw sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, it touches us, it pricks us. It's like a dagger in our heart. It makes us to cry and to weep and say, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. And look at the story in um, Genesis chapter 19, verse 16. And while he lingered, the man, that is the angels, laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord be merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city, outside the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. Look up here. That's the reason we say it's conditional preservation. Not automatic preservation. Conditional preservation. Oh, the Lord was merciful unto him. Abraham prayed for him. Abraham was concerned about him. And the angels were sent to the city. And the angels laid hold of their hands. And the angels said, now you have a part to play. We're not going to do everything for you. The preacher is not going to do everything for you. The Bible is not going to do everything for you. God is not going to do everything for you. You are a free moral agent. You have a choice to make. You have a decision to take. You have a direction, a path to walk in. And you have your life to live. You have a responsibility. That's why the angel said, we've led you thus far. This Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed. But you escape for your life. Escape to the mountain. Don't stay in the valley. Not only that, Lot, Lot's wife, you two daughters, only four souls saved out of the multitudes in Sodom and Gomorrah. Only four of you. There's one condition here now. Look not behind you. You have a condition. That's the reason Lot's wife could not make it. Look at verse 26. And his wife looked back from behind him. And she became a pillar of salt. Condition, condition, conditional preservation for the righteous. Think about this. Marriage to Lord. Having an in-law, Abraham, that knew God. Hearing the word of God coming from Abraham, the greatest man, the friend of God in that age. Related to somebody that could have helped her to get to heaven and to escape. The judgment of God. And being visited by an angel, can you imagine that the angel, one of the angels laid hold of the hands. Two angels, four hands, four people. One holding Lot, the other hand holding Lot's wife, and then one holding one daughter, the other hand holding the other daughter. Angel holding her hand. Angel looking straight into her face like this and say, God is merciful to you. This is your day of deliverance. You are escaping the judgment of God. Look at that mountain. They escaped to the mountain. Lord's wife, look at me eyeball to eyeball. Don't look back. I know your heart. The worldliness and the treasure and the precious things you are keeping in Sodom and Gomorrah. But what shall it profit a man? What shall it profit you, woman, if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? Conditional preservation of the righteous. Don't look back. And you release them. For them to go, escape. Sodom and Gomorrah was born in. And then she began to think. The things were left behind. All the servants. All the cattle. Maybe the gold and the silver. Maybe the friends that are back in the world. Is it how we're going to lose everything? And she looked back. That was final. As we're talking, more than 6,000 years or more than 4,000 years have passed. That woman is still in hellfire. Where will you spend eternity? This question comes to you and to me. Tell me what shall your answer be? Where will you spend eternity? Many are going the downward way today. And they do not understand that just looking back, 
and disobeying what they call a small part of the commandment of God will make them to spend eternity in hellfire. And it says, sad, sad, sad. Will their final ending be? And a question comes to you, where will you spend eternity? That's why it says, repent and believe today and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that on the final day, because you have believed and because you stand in righteousness and you refuse to turn back and you refuse to look back because if any man Jesus said he that lays his hand on the plow and he looks back is no more fit for the kingdom of God that's why he said remember Lord's wife repent believe so that your happy ending will be I'm saved I'm saved saved through a long eternity it's a serious matter that's why we came and that's why you need to consider your eternity and your eternal end. This woman was lost. Conditional preservation of the righteous. And then we're told eventually, hey, look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 from verse 28. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lord, they did eat, and they drank, and they bought, and they sold, and they planted, and they built it. The same day that Lord went out of Sodom, he trained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which it be upon the house top, and is top in the house, let him not come down to take it away and he that is in the field let him likewise not return i'm telling you this because of what happened to lord's wife remember lord's wife i told you and i read it to you that lord was grieved was in agony was in pain was troubled was vexed because of the evil deeds of the people that he saw and that he heard every day and those who are going to be preserved from the judgment of God will be like that. They'll be the people that are sorrowful because of the evil around them. They'll not be the people that join the crowd, that join the evil deeds of the people. They'll be the people that are so sorrowful and so sad because of the immorality and the evil that is in society. And their hearts are troubled every time. When they see anything that is evil, in Ezekiel chapter 9, reading from verse 4, Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, it says, And the Lord says, said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. The people that are marked for preservation, the people that are mad to escape the judgment of God are the people that sigh, the people that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity, slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary and they began then they began at the ancient men which were before the house you see that the people that are going to be preserved on that final day are the people that are, uh, they are sorrowful because of the evil things they turn to Psalm 119 Psalm 119 verse 53 119 of the Psalms verse 53 horror has taken hold upon me because of the wickedness, because of the wicked that forsake the law. Here the psalmist said, as I move around and I see people that they were with the law of God before and they loved the word of God before, but now they are forsaking the law of God. They become wicked. Horror has taken hold of me in verse 136. It says in verse 136 over here, it says, rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not your law. Look up here. If you know anybody around you, now, whenever he sees people do something, some people doing something that is not right, he's easily moved to tears. And when he wants to talk to them, he'll be saying, but why are you doing like this? With all the word of God we're hearing, with all the privileges we have, and before he talks too long, he starts crying. Oh, people say, that man is weak. That woman is weak. Hey, see, hey, just because people are telling lies and because people are stealing and because people are committing adultery and fornication, every time he hears this, he's crying. 
If you are crying like that, you will never stop crying. Because people are going to be committing sin every day. What are you crying about? You become a water bag. You become a jellyfish. You become so weak that every little, little thing you see, you cry. Those are the people going to heaven, my friend. You people who are not bothered because people commit sin, you're not going to heaven. You people who are happy, you people who rejoice, you people who go on eating and dancing and drinking and doing whatever you want, no matter who is committing adultery, no matter who is committing fornication, no matter who is uh, pregnating a lady before they get married, it never bothers you. You're not going to heaven. Those people that are not unhappy, you're not sad, you're not sorrowful. Whenever the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, whenever his name is dishonored, whenever the word of God is pulled to the ground, whenever the church of the living God is dragged into the mold, and they compare the church that is preaching righteousness and holiness with the church with the white garment churches, and it never bothers you. You're not going to heaven. The people that are going to heaven, the people that are going to be spared from the judgment of God are the people, they are sad, they are sorrowful, they are crying, and they're weeping whenever they see that the name of the glorious God of the eternal God is pulled to the mud, they are sad. Those are the people that will get to heaven. If you join them and you become convenient with all the evils in the world, you cannot make it. 136, again, rivers of water. That's a lot of crime, my friend. That's a lot of crime. Rivers of water surround down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. In verse 158, it says, I beheld the transgressors. I was grieved because they kept not thy word. I beheld the transgressors. I looked at them. Transgressors. I looked at the way they dress. And the way they comport themselves. And these men and women that do rubbish, rotten things in society, in the open. I look at them. I couldn't continue looking. Because when I saw what they did, I was grieved in my heart. Those are the people getting to heaven. Because the reason why God spared Lord is that his righteous soul was vexed, was troubled, was grieved because of the wicked deeds of the people. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, reading from verse 17. In Philippians 3 verse 17, it says, Brethren, be, ye fo be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. You want to tell me that Paul was a weak man? You want to tell me that Paul was having psychological problems? Ah, this is the man, when he became born again, he, was, uh, he began to preach the gospel. He was thrown over the wall in Damascus by a basket. This is a man, anywhere he came, they stoned him. And when they stoned him, he rose up again and began to preach the gospel. And then this is the man that they gave lashes to, 39 lashes, many times. This is the man that had shipwreck and he said, I'm still moving on. This is the man that said everywhere we go. The Holy Spirit is saying in every city that bounds and afflictions await me in Jerusalem. But I'm still going there because these things do not move me. And all these things, I count them as nothing. Just to finish the ministry, the cause that the Lord had given me. You want to tell me that that man was a weak man? That man was strong and yet as strong as he was. As strong as he was. He said, I'm telling you that many, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And I'm telling you now, I'm even weeping over them. These are the people going to heaven. It says their end in verse 19, whose end is destruction and whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind as things. That's the reason why you need to reconsider your own Christian life. Are you a real Christian? The evil you see in society, does it bother you at all? Are you ever sad? Are you ever unhappy? Are you ever sorrowful? Because of the evil you see in society, if you are not righteous enough to grieve, to, to be sorrowful over the evil you see in society, you cannot get to heaven. I come to point number two. Confirmed punishment for the unrighteous. Confirmed punishment for the unrighteous. I'm reading the second part of verse 9. In Second Peter chapter 2. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. To be punished. To reserve the unjust, the ungodly, the unrighteous, 
the sinners, the backsliders, until the day of judgment to be punished. Here is the confirmation of the punishment for unbelievers, for unrighteous people. Confirmed punishment for the unrighteous. Come to Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21, verse 29 and verse 30. Have ye not asked them that go by the way? And do ye not know their tokens that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction? Confirmed. Confirmed punishment for the unrighteous. Are you not asking? Ask people that know God. Ask people that know the way of God. Ask people that know the attributes of God. The attributes of the unchanging God. They will tell you that the wicked is reserved unto the day of judgment. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. It's confirmed. And then in Nahum, Nahum, you'll see this word reserved, 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 reserved to the day of judgment, to the perdition, to the wrath of the Almighty God. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, God is jealous. And the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. Who are the enemies of God? The enemies of God are the people that oppose God. Who are the people that oppose God? The people that oppose God are the people that oppose the word of God. The way of God. The plan of God. The righteous demand of God. God says, this is the way to go. They say, no, no way. We're not going to do that. Those are the enemies of God. They fight God and they fight his word. And they fight his righteous plan. And he says, those enemies of God, basically those are the sinners. Those are the unrighteous people. Those are the people that refuse to give their lives and their all unto the Lord. They refuse to come under the authority of the Almighty God. They want Satan and self to rule them, to control them, because they enjoy the pleasures of sin. Those enemies of God, the righteous, the wicked, they are reserved unto the wrath of the Almighty God. In the Proverbs chapter 11, Proverbs, no matter how clever a sinner, a wicked man, a wicked woman may be, he will not escape the judgment of God. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 21. 11, 21. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Though hand join in hand, uh, that you are in covenant with other people, doing evil, it's not going to excuse that evil, that to join hands together with powerful people, wealthy people, rich people, highly placed people, notorious people, people with long leg, as they say, people with contacts and relations that are significant in society, that to join hands with them to do evil, that's not going to make God afraid of you. Was God afraid of Pharaoh and the magicians and the people that joined hands with them? Did they not all perish in the Red Sea? Was God afraid of Goliath and the Philistines in their bragging those 40 days because they are strong and because they intimidate and terrify the children of Israel? Does that mean they terrify and intimidate Almighty God? Was God afraid of Nebuchadnezzar and all his counselors and senators when they joined hands together to do evil and to raise up an idol? Was God afraid of him in chapter 3? Didn't he turn him to an animal in chapter 4? Was God afraid of Herod because he had the power to kill all those children when Jesus Christ was born and the people that joined hands with him? Was God afraid of him and them? Was God afraid of the Israelites, the Jews, that crucified Jesus and they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children? Didn't God deal with them 70 years after when millions of them, when they were destroyed and they went into perdition? 
Was God afraid of Nero that punished and persecuted the early church? Was God afraid of them? If God was not afraid of them, is God afraid of anybody here in Nigeria, here in Africa, here in the world? Do hands be joined with hands? The sinner, the unrighteous, shall not be unpunished. And that, that's the reason why you need to repent, because there's confirmation of judgment upon the unbelievers, upon the sinners. In Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible in verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 21. 26, verse 21. Behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. Psalm 73. Sometimes, you know, brothers and sisters... When you look around you, and you see how people commit sin with impunity, and they commit sin as if nobody can hold us, and you are righteous, and you are walking your way, and you are doing your, the will of God, and you see all these people, they cheat you, they oppress you, and they do things, and if you even say anything, they say, let that God do what he wants to do. They're like Nebuchadnezzar, who is that God? If I decide to deal with you the way I want, then uh, sometimes you are thinking, is it really useful, profitable to reach, uh, to live a righteous life? Because we righteous people in this life, see how they drive us about, see how they dribble us around as if we are their football. Is God really judging people? You need to read Psalm 73. Come on now. Verse 2. As for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps were nice sleep. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. But their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. If they do anything and the police catches, uh, catch them, uh, they go there and before two days they release them. It's we innocent people that suffer without anybody to bail us. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Their pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes turned out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. They are corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. And they speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither. That is the people of uh, those wicked men. And then he says, waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. That is, they have national cake. They take uh, everything, and we don't have anything. We're just living from hand to mouth. And then it says, therefore, and they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, ah, look at this. I have cleansed my hands in vain and washed my hands in innocence for all the day long. Have I been plagued and chastised every morning? If I say I will speak thus, behold, I will offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. When I looked at society, and I look at how the unbelievers are prospering, and we righteous people that will not bribe, that will not do anything wrong, ah, we, we are coming behind them. He said, when I thought to know about it, it was too painful for me to understand. And then he said, until I went into the sanctuary of God. That's why coming to church is important. Because there are many things that confuse your mind over there that you can't understand. But when you come to the sanctuary of God, and then God begins to reveal his mind and his will and his word unto you, then you understand what you didn't understand. It says, until I went to the sanctuary of God, 
Then I understood their end. Surely thou didst set them. It is in slippery places that casted them down into destruction. How are they brought into destruction? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. You see, judgment is going to come upon them. The terror of the Almighty is going to come upon them. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, rather. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Reading there in verses 8 and 9. Second Thessalonians 1, 8, an inflaming fire with vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The, the punishment is there. It will come. It will come. It's confirmed punishment for the unrighteous. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. Verse 31 through to 33. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand. But the goats on the left. What will happen to those stubborn, rebellious goats on the left? Incorrigible goats on the left. Unrighteous goats. Wicked goats on the left. And the people that will not have the word of God to rule over them set on the left hand side. What will happen to them in verse 41? Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand side side depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels if you have been obedient to the devil you have been faithful to the devil here and you have been against the almighty god and the word of god and the love of christ and the mercy and the grace of christ then you'll spend eternity with satan and his angels in hell fire forever that's why it says in verse 46 and these shall go into everlasting punishment those ones on the left hand side, they will go into everlasting punishment. I'm reading to you from Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 6. It's still telling us that the punishment of the ungodly, the, the punishment of the unrighteous, it is confirmed. And it cannot change. It's irrevocable, irreversible. In Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But after thy hardness and the impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. And the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, that is, those who are impenitent, incorrigible, unchanging, persistent, and they remain in their evil. No matter, no matter, no matter the topic of the study of the day. No matter the penetrating arrows of the Spirit of God. No matter the description of the judgment of the eternal God that is going to fall upon the unrighteous, upon the unconverted, upon the backslider, upon the sinner. No matter how fiery the warning of God may be, they still continue impenitent in sin, incorrigible in sin. It says in that verse 5, after the hardness of your heart, and the impenitence of your heart. You treasure up to yourself. Wrath against the day of wrath. And the revelation of the righteous judgment of God in verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. And then he goes on into verse 8. And it says tribulation. Sorry. In verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. But obey unrighteousness. There will be indignation. Wrath. Tribulation anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the jew first and also of the gentiles and so you'll see what the lord is telling us and you know god is not going to it's not going to look at you and say because of this can you bribe god no you cannot that's why verse 11 says for there is no respect of persons with god that's the reason we need to just recall ourselves and remind ourselves that this God is an uncompromising God. He judges sin. In fact, it says, God is angry with the wicked every day. And those who sin against the light, who willfully continue in sin after they have received the knowledge of the truth, they will be punished severely. 
Those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They know the truth. They come to the Bible study. They come to the church. They hold that truth in unrighteousness. Because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. Uh, they, are de they are deriving some fleshly gain. Fleshly pleasure in that sin. And the present pleasure is more important to them than the future eternal pain. And those who are like that, and they have pleasure in unrighteousness, and they harden their hearts against the pleading and the warning of a loving God. They will suffer the divine judgment and eternal punishment of Almighty God. It will be forever and ever. Now, these righteous people that the Bible says, he knows how to reserve the ungodly, unto the day of judgment to be punished. What's their description? Who are they? What do they look like? Turn to Second Peter chapter 2. That brings us to point number 3. From verse 10. Chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not really an accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they do not understand. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption. The unrighteous, they are described here. And actually, this is giving us, if you go back to verse 1, it's telling us the description, number 1, of false prophets, number 2, of false teachers, number 3, of the many that follow their pernicious ways. Those are mentioned in verses 1 and 2. False doctrine has a way of doing something in our lives, number 1. False doctrine has a way of destroying biblical conviction. Show me a man, show me a woman, show me a member of a church like this. That has been coming and has developed, has built up biblical convictions over the years. When you become associated with false prophets, you love their cases, you love their literature, and you love to listen to them on the radio. Because you, you need to understand, there are some people in the world who are listening to those politicians when they campaign. Those people can talk. It's not everybody that talks convincingly, that is speaking the truth. And if you if you built up conviction, biblical conviction over the years, and then you now begin to listen to cassettes, and you begin to read literature, and you begin to hear them on the radio, see them on the television or internet, whichever, and they talk and talk, and they put it this way and put it this way, and they convince you, within a short time, they erode your biblical conviction. They begin to pump doubt into you that the things you stood on before, you cannot stand upon them anymore. You're shaky, you're unstable. And when the wind comes, when any rebuke, any correction comes in the church, the wind will just blow you away. Because those false prophets and false teachers, with their false preaching, they have a way of, number one, destroying biblical conviction. Number two, discrediting and defaming the true and the faithful preachers. You need to understand. Before, look up here, please, brothers and sisters. A man, before you can take a girl, who is so committed to the father and the mother that if they, when she goes to school, she is eager to come back home and see daddy and mommy before somebody can turn the mind of that girl away from the father and the mother, he must discredit the father and the mother and turn the mind of that girl away unto himself. Before a false prophet can turn the mind of a woman or a man away from, because this man and this woman, they love themselves, they eat together, they do everything together. If they don't see one another, they are not at peace, they are not at rest. If they go anywhere, they want to come back home, they love one another so much. Before a false prophet can turn the mind of that man away from this woman, he has to be convincing him, this woman is a witch. This woman does not really love you. Those witches who destroy businesses, that is how they do. They will look intimate and close and friendly and loving. And they will get near to you. The nearer they are, the more they are able to destroy you. And they will be turning the mind of the man, turning the mind of the man, turning the mind of the man, until the man will hate the woman he loved before. And before a false prophet can take somebody who is so committed 
in a church like this, in the morning he wakes up, he's thinking about the church. Anywhere he goes, he's thinking about how to come back to the church. If they make any announcement to contribute this, he's the one to, he'll pump all his accounts, he'll pump it into the church work. The word of God is carrying tracks about and is listening to the cases and, and he's so enwrapped with uh, the message of the word of God. Bible study like this is running. If he ever gets late, he says I'm late. What, what happened to me today? He's there, he's praying, he's singing, he's doing everything. Before a false prophet can call, catch that man, catch that woman and turn his mind away from sound doctrine, he will first of all discredit his pastor. Discredit his preacher. Because he discovers that this man it's like he's drunk with appreciation for his preacher and pastor. Before he says anything, our father in the Lord, our pastor, our teacher, our Jesus, our whatever. And before a man can turn your mind away from such a man like that, he'll first of all discredit your pastor. Oh, what are you talking about? Do you know the kind of power they, try, they depend upon in secret? Do you know where they go? What are you talking about? Uh, do you know, what do you know? You are a small, you are a small girl. You are a small, you are a small man in the kingdom of God. We know, we know. And then they turn you away, they turn you away, they turn you away. That's why you are sitting down and you are hearing the preaching of the man instead of hearing the word that you used to enjoy and the ones you used to appreciate. You are thinking of that thing you heard. That lie of the devil. You are saying, eh, he's reading the Bible. How about? He's quoting. How about? His mouth is sweet. Like adultery, fornication, <laughs> holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord. How about the discredit and the fame? Your man of God and your prophet and your preacher and your pastor. That's the, that's the thing that false prophets do. They have to discredit the people you have confidence in before they can catch you. Number three, another thing it does, it deforms your Christian character. That you have been standard, you have been standing before, you have been upright before. But then the false prophets will deform your Christian character. The unrighteous people that will be judged and will have eternal punishment. Look at the description. Number one, they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. They walk after the flesh. And, and they excuse it. If you go to their fellowship. And they are coming like this and they see, and they see a lady. Oh, they, I... My sister, wonderful. And then they embrace her. Watch them. They don't embrace the ugly girls. The ugly ladies is the beautiful ones, the charming ones, the you know the one. They don't they don't embrace the lean ones that are like you know like this pole. Look up here, like this one. They don't embrace those ones. You know how are you, my sister? And you say, eh. Our pastor does not, ah, uh, your pastor. Those people, they don't have love. They have doctrine. They don't have love. Here there is love in the lust of the flesh of their uncleanness. Those are the places some people are going. So then, number one, the false prophets, they are the people that have uncleanness. Number two, it says that they despise God-appointed leadership. When it says government there, it's the government of the Christian assembly. Number three, it says they are presumptuous. Number four, it says they are self-will. They set themselves against the word of God and the will of God. Number five, they are bold and they are fearless in speaking evil against the authorities appointed and established by God. Number six, they speak evil of divine things that they do not understand. That's the reason we shouldn't get involved with them because the character of these evil people is just so evil that you cannot associate with them if you want to please God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves to mankind, that's homosexuals and lesbians, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Don't let anybody deceive you in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For this ye know that no monger. No unclean person, no covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and in the kingdom of God. And look at Jeremiah chapter 44, because it says, look at this. It says, these people that are going to get to hell, 
that are going to be punished forever and ever in describing their character, their conduct, and their practice. It says they walk in the flesh, in the lust of uncleanness. It also says they are very presumptuous. It says they are self-willed. Look at that self-will now. In Jeremiah chapter 44, Jeremiah chapter 44, reading verse 16, and then verse 17. And we go down the line, 44, verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. That is self-will. Can you please look up for a moment? As we come to this solemn assembly, a serious study of the word of God, and the Spirit of God faithfully gives us the word, can there be, can there be friends in a group that will go out there after the study and after all that we have heard will influence one another as for the word that that man has spoken we're not going to do it he's talking about heaven and hell as if he's the only preacher that preaches the truth he's talking about holiness as if he's the only one that knows god tell me you're my friend i'm your friend are we not in covenant together are we going to do nothing no we're not going to do it. They come into a covenant of perdition. And they make up their minds as for the word that that man has spoken, that word of salvation and that word of holiness, because it says, he has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Whosoever therefore despises, despises not man, but God. God, who also has given us of his Holy Spirit, but they come into a covenant and they say, no, we will not do it. And then they influence other people. Those people who are careful, they are repenting, they want to live a righteous life, we don't know when Jesus will come, I want to make myself ready, so I can make it. They go to them, and they say, what's the matter with you? Are you so weak that you are, you are bothered? I thought you had a strong mind. Are you, are you, so, are, are you so timid? Now that thing that just that man spoke, that's the thing you are thinking about now, and the thing that is, and you are crying and repenting and all, what's the matter with you? And then they make him bold to go back into sin. That's the self-will. Those are the people described in the scriptures that they are self-willed and they are going to perish. It says, look at it with me again, is uh, Jeremiah chapter 44 and verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken, unto us in the name of the lord we will not hearken unto thee but we will certainly do whatsoever come and go forth out of our own mouth we will do whatever we want to do and nobody will be able to challenge us verse 26 it says there therefore hear ye the word of the lord all judah that dwell in the land of egypt behold i have sworn by my great name says the lord that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of judah in all the land of egypt saying the lord god liveth behold i will watch over them for evil and not for good and all the men of judah that are in the land of egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there be an end of them verse 29 and this shall be a sign unto you says the lord that i will punish you in this place that ye may know that my word shall surely stand against you for evil you know the lord has shown us very clearly today that there is judgment coming. And that judgment is going to be fiery and furious upon the people that continue in sin. And the only way to be able to escape this judgment of God is number one, to repent. Number two, to turn away from every evil sin and from every way of unrighteousness. Number three, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the grace of God to live in righteousness. Have you seen the word of God? Are you still considering whether I will or I will not? Will you not give your life to the Lord today? Or are you saying, I'm not fully persuaded yet, only almost, almost persuaded to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seem some souls to say, go, spirit, go thy way, some convenient day. 
I'll call on you. Almost persuaded. Why don't you come and come today? Almost persuaded. Turn not away. Jesus is inviting you here. Angels are lingering there. Prayers rise from heart. So they are wondering. Backslider, please come. Almost persuaded. Harvest is past. Almost persuaded. Doom comes at last. Almost. Almost. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad. Sad. Their bitter cry. Almost, but lost. There's eternity waiting for you. And we're almost getting there now. And the question is, where will you spend eternity? Don't ask me, don't ask your friend. Ask yourself, where will you spend eternity? Many are turning from all their sins today. And they're receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. They're saying, yes, I abandon the way of sin. I don't want to perish. I don't want to be punished for the wicked people in eternity. And they're repenting and praying upon the name of the Lord. Say, yes, Lord, receive me. I give myself to you. Happy will be their final end. They'll be saved, saved, saved through all eternity. I encourage you to come to the Lord today. Escape for your life because judgment is coming. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you live a life that is glorifying to the Lord, you will be saved and His power is there, His grace is there to be able to keep you for the mercy of God until the final day. Pray before you go and settle everything with the Lord.